Luke chapter 22. I'm going to begin reading at verse 1, skip a few verses, but end up down in verse 20. So Luke chapter 22, verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, that is Jesus, for they feared the people. You have to keep in mind that they didn't accept him as the Messiah, so they thought he was an imposter. They thought he, would make, he was making blasphemous statements. They wanted to kill Jesus, but he was popular right now with the people. So the leaders are trying to figure out how can we kill Jesus without upsetting the people. Jump down to verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. That is the Passover lamb. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. And so they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. And then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There, make ready." And so they went and found it, just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Let's pause there and pray. Lord, it's good to be in your house, and as we open up your word now, we pray that you'll speak to us through this passage. We thank you that Jesus laid his life down for the sins of the world. And uh, Lord, we just worship you and we thank you. We thank you that you loved us so much that you offer us the free gift of salvation, that all who would believe and receive would be saved. And we trust you today. We love you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Well, as we've been making our way through the Gospel of Luke, I've mentioned to you that the last six chapters of Luke, chapters 19 through 24, detail the final week of Jesus' life. And just by way of quick outline, chapter 19 uh, records how Jesus comes into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. Now, he has come here for the Jewish feast of Passover. That's what we've just been reading about in our opening text. Every Jewish male aged 21 years and older was required to go to Jerusalem during these, these days for three major feasts on the Jewish calendar. No matter where you lived in the world, you were expected to make pilgrimage there to Jerusalem for one of the three major feasts. Passover is one of the three major feasts. So Jesus has made his way to Jerusalem along with his disciples from the upper Galilee region. It's a walk of a distance of about 85 to 90 miles. And they've come here to Jerusalem to share this Passover meal and little do his disciples know that it will be his last Passover meal with them. Chapters 20 to 21 record how Jesus is in the courtyard area, the temple courtyard area, teaching and ministering to people. And then we come here to chapter 22, where Jesus shares the last Passover meal with his disciples. And he will be hanging from a cross in less than 24 hours after this. This last Passover meal that Jesus shares with his disciples is more commonly known in our culture as the Last Supper. Leonardo da Vinci captured this in his famous painting by the same name. The painting was completed in 1498. It measures 15 feet wide by 29 feet long. And it hangs today in a convent in Milan, Italy. But to be honest with you, um, Da Vinci took, uh, shall we say, artistic liberty 
uh, because probably the, the Passover meal, the last supper that Jesus shared with his disciples looked nothing like this. Uh, in the first place, um, it, they were not as effeminate looking. I mean, I just have to be honest with you. <laughs> da Vinci painted these men uh, uh, kind of girly. I gotta, be, I gotta be straight up with you. In fact, so much so, it's not just my opinion, so much so that if you look at Jesus at the center of the table, to his right is actually John the Apostle. But he looks so effeminate that it has given rise over the years to the conspiracy that it was really Mary Magdalene. Okay, it was not Mary Magdalene. It's just a very feminine looking John, okay? <laughs> the other thing is that Da Vinci portrayed the Last Supper in a long rectangular table. But in first century, the Jews would have sat around something, it was actually a Roman term called a triclinium. A triclinium was a U-shaped table so that you could get people on all sides of the U and so therefore you could see each other better. It was probably not one strong rectang uh, one long rec rectangular table as Da Vinci portrayed it. I mean, it's a picture, so he's trying to do, you know, the best to get every face in there, but it was probably a U-shaped triclinium. They would sit around this table. It was a table built low to the ground and they would actually recline. They would recline typically Jewish style on their left shoulder, on their left elbow, and they would eat with their right hand. Legs extended away from the table. And it tells us a little bit in the Bible about who would have been sitting next to Jesus. Um, it does tell us in John's Gospel, John, when he records about the last Passover, the last supper, he refers to himself in John chapter 13 as the one who leaned against Jesus' breast. Well, that makes it, Da Vinci was right on this, that John would have been on Jesus' right. Because as everybody is leaning on their left elbow, eating with their right hand, you have your back to the person next to you. The only way you can see them or listen to them when they're talking is if you actually lean back onto their chest so that he could see Jesus. So that does tell us that little language in John 13 saying that, that John leaned back on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper tells us that John would have been to Jesus' right. We also know from the Bible that Judas would have been to Jesus' left because the Bible says that they shared the same bowl when they were dipping their bread. And we know that John was on Jesus' right, so that means Judas had to be to Jesus' left. You know the old saying, keep your friends close and your enemies even closer. And this is what Jesus was doing. So this is what we're reading about here. It's, it's the Passover. It is the Last Supper. If you've been around church for very long, you would be familiar with the language as I read the opening passage when Jesus took the bread and said what he did and he took the cup and he said what he did because that is the language that we quote whenever we share communion together. Now, um, we call it communion here. Some of you might refer to it as the Lord's Supper. Some of your traditions call it the Eucharist. The Eucharist is just a Greek word that means thanksgiving. So we're talking the same thing in terms of the communion celebration or the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, the bread being a symbol of his body, the cup, the wine, the juice being a symbol of his blood. And what we call communion, which is, again, what we're going to share at the end of our service today, what we call communion was not invented by the church for the sake of a ritual. Communion was derived straight from the Jewish Passover. When we share communion together, we are preserving an element of the Jewish Passover. So in order to understand one, you have to understand both. You have to understand the other. And why? The answer is because Jesus links the two. He takes an ancient Jewish feast that the Jews had been celebrating at the time of Jesus for about 1,450 years. He takes the ancient Jewish feast of Passover and he links it, he connects it to his own sacrifice on the cross. And by connecting the two, Jesus gives new meaning to an old feast. 
We have to look at the past in order to understand the present. So here's a little history lesson for those of you unfamiliar with the Jewish Passover. In about the year 1880 BC, 1900 BC, somewhere in that time frame, a group of 70 Israelites that actually comprised the entire nation at that time, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 70. Jacob had 12 sons, and their descendants numbered around 70 at this time. They made their way from Israel to Egypt because the Bible tells us there was a severe famine in Israel at this particular time. To escape the famine, they go down to Egypt, where they are reunited with one of Jacob's 12 sons that they thought was dead because the brothers had betrayed their son, their brothers. His name was Joseph. Joseph, by God's providence, had been eventually promoted to become the second most powerful man next to Pharaoh himself in all of Egypt. So the 70 that come down into Egypt are reunited with Joseph. There's this wonderful exchange of forgiveness for how they mistreated him. And those 70 receive favor from that particular Pharaoh because of Joseph's high standing. But that Pharaoh dies eventually. And when that Pharaoh dies, so does the favorable standing that they had enjoyed with that Pharaoh. Another Pharaoh comes to power. And succeeding Pharaohs resent the Hebrew foreigners who were in their land. They've overstayed their welcome, they think. And so the Hebrews who are there in Egypt become enslaved. The Egyptians enslave them and use them as slave labor for 400 years, 430 to be exact. During the course of the 400 years, that initial group of 70 will populate to be a few million people living in the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh will use them to build some of the great cities, some of the great ancient cities of Egypt. Well, the Bible says that over the course of this 400 plus years, the Hebrew slaves cry out to God. They have been mistreated, they have been oppressed. And the Bible says that their cries go up to God and God sees their oppression. And so he raises up a deliverer, a prophet from among them. His name is Moshe. That's Hebrew. His given name that we refer to in English is Moses. He raises up Moses to be the deliverer, to set the people free from, Pharaoh, from Pharaoh's clutches, to lead them back to the promised land of Israel, which they had never seen. Because remember, this is an entire generation over 400 years that have only known slavery in Egypt. They've never even been to the promised land. God raises up Moses to be their deliverer. Moses confronts Pharaoh, demands that Pharaoh would let the people go. But Pharaoh is very angry and very reluctant. Why is he going to want to let, let a free slave labor force go when they have been used by him to build some of the great structures and cities in ancient Egypt? So God then unleashes a series of nine plagues to wear Pharaoh down. But Pharaoh is still reluctant to let them go. And so then God unleashes a tenth plague, the most severe and devastating of them all. The tenth plague is so severe that Pharaoh not only allows the Hebrew slaves to go back to Israel, he orders them out of his country. That tenth severe plague was the death of the firstborn. God would strike down the firstborn of every family and every animal among the livestock too, throughout the land of Egypt, because of Pharaoh's stubborn refusal to let God's people go. So therefore, God unleashes this most devastating plague, the firstborn shall die. Well, among the Hebrews who are living there in Egypt at this time, their firstborn is protected because God gave careful instructions. You are to slay a lamb. When you slay the lamb, you are to take the blood of the lamb in a hyssop branch used like a paintbrush, and you are to splash the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of your home. So that when God passed through the land to administer the sentence of death, he would pass over those homes that were marked by the blood of the lamb. Thus the term Passover. In Hebrew, it is Pesach. God passed over the homes that were marked by the blood of the lamb and death did not come to those within that home. 
And thus it brings us to Passover, Pesach. Now, Passover was actually an eight-day feast that God said, I want you from this day forward to commemorate this great miraculous deliverance. Because at this point, after the 10th plague, Pharaoh ordered the Hebrews to go, to leave. And on the way to the promised land, they went. An eight-day feast to always remember God's great deliverance on this day. The first of the eight days was called Passover. That was the day on which the lamb was slaughtered and the lamb was eaten as a family meal. And then the seven days that followed was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Why unleavened bread? Because as part of the hasty departure that the Israelites made when they left Egypt, they didn't have enough time to, let, to add leaven or yeast to their bread. The Bible says that they just grabbed their kneading bowls of dough and ran. And so because they didn't have time to add the leaven for the yeast to rise to make bread, they were to commemorate this great miraculous deliverance by eating bread without yeast, unleavened bread, matzah is what it's called in, in Hebrew. So this whole feast, Passover, the slaughtering of the lamb, the eating of the meal of the lamb, then in successive years to commemorate this great deliverance, the blood of the lamb, which saved them, the eating of matzah, a bread without yeast, to remember how they left in haste without time for their bread to rise. All of this happens here as part of God's divine orchestrated plan of a great deliverance from the slavery of Egypt. And the main purpose of Passover in a phrase is that it commemorates God's deliverance of the Jews from the slavery of Egypt. And Jews today uh, still celebrate Passover. In fact, it's next week. And Jewish families all around the world will gather together with friends and family in their homes, and they will eat a Passover meal together called a Seder. It'll be a time that symbolizes freedom. It's a time that symbolizes national pride. And it is a time to be with family. And when they share the Seder meal together, they will have various food elements that remind them of their hardship as slaves in Egypt. And they will recite various prayers. And they will sing various songs to commemorate God's miraculous deliverance from slavery. And what a miraculous deliverance it was. But then Jesus comes along and he describes an even greater miraculous deliverance. And he brings new meaning to the whole Passover feast. Here he is in Luke chapter 22 and he's sharing this Passover meal with his Jewish disciples. This is what they do. They've done it every year for the last 1400 years or so at this time. But suddenly Jesus brings new meaning to this whole Passover feast and he takes the bread, he takes the matzah, the bread without yeast, and he gives thanks and he breaks it. And he says, this is my body which is given for you, broken for you, take and eat in remembrance of me. He's like, wait a minute. This is brand new to the meaning of Passover. Jesus is about to be crucified and he takes the bread without yeast and he says, this is a picture of my body. This is a picture of my life. And then he takes the cup. Now, there are four cups to the Passover meal. Jesus takes the third cup. And the reason we know he takes the third cup is because two words in the Gospels, it says, after supper. The cup that was taken after supper was the third cup. Listen to me on this. It was the cup of redemption. Jesus takes the cup of redemption. And he gives thanks. Now, here's the traditional thanks in Hebrew that is given for the third cup today at the Passover meal. Baruch atah Adonai Elohanu Malech HaOlam Bori Peri Hagafen. It translates, blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Jesus gives thanks, and then he adds to this cup this meaning. This cup is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. Drink all of it in remembrance of me. Now, this is amazing what Jesus is doing here at this ancient Passover feast. It totally changes the meaning. It totally changes, expounds the meaning, helps us to understand that what was happening in 1450 B.C. in Egypt when they were allowed to leave 
their 400 years of slavery translates into a greater deliverance that is intended for all of us through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Jesus takes this ancient Passover feast that the Jews had been celebrating for centuries, and for centuries it had pointed back to their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. And now Jesus comes along and says that all along, Passover was actually really pointing towards something forward to a day of greater deliverance for all people, not from the slavery of Egypt, but from a greater bondage, which is the slavery of sin that Jesus came to set us free from, to offer us forgiveness and life in his name through his sacrifice on the cross. So you have to think now. You have to think about what the disciples are thinking in this moment. I mean, again, from this time that we're reading here in Luke 22, for the last 1,450 or so years, they had been celebrating Passover with one thing in mind. This has to do with the day that we were set free from slavery in Egypt, the suffering that we endured, all that we went through. And God raised up Moses as a great deliverer who led us out. Wait a minute. Now they're sitting here thinking, holy smokes, this is something totally different. Jesus comes along and he says, okay, this bread, this bread here, you know, this bread without yeast, okay, you know what it's a picture of? You've been eating it for 1,450 plus years. You know what it really points to? It points to my life without sin. My life without sin that was offered for you on a cross so that through faith in me, My body was broken. My life, my life, sinless as it was, hung on a cross to provide a greater deliverance for you. Not just from the slavery of Egypt, but from the slavery of sin. And then he takes the cup. And they're thinking, oh yeah, the cup has always represented the fruit of the vine. We give thanks to God for his redemption, how he redeemed us out of Egypt through the blood of the Lamb. And Jesus comes along and he goes, no, no, this cup actually has been pointing toward me to this day in its fulfillment. Because let the wine or let the juice symbolize my blood that is shed on the cross so that you might have a greater redemption than what you experienced in Egypt. So that you might be redeemed from your sins. So that the blood of the lamb would cause God to pass over you so that you wouldn't have to suffer the consequences for your sin. Is anybody grateful for that? Amen. Amen. So, when Jesus takes the elements and says, look, listen, all of this was ultimately pointing to me. This is why Paul, when he would write to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, called Jesus our Passover lamb. He says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. John the Baptist understood it also. When Jesus came to be baptized, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So, important questions. How is Jesus our Passover lamb? And what does that mean for each of us? I'm going to take you through seven quick points. I'm going to go to the back wall and kind of just walk through these. And I'm going to go so quickly that you won't be able to take notes. It's okay. The beauty is they will archive this tomorrow and you can put me on pause. (laughs) Here are the seven things. And I want you to see Passover past, Passover present fulfilled in Jesus. Number one, the lamb was selected or inspected on the 10th of Nisan. That's the Jewish calendar. On the 10th day of the month of Nisan, according to Exodus 12, 3, it was specific. You were to take a lamb from the flock and you were to observe it and inspect it. Don't slaughter it yet. It was to be observed to make sure that there was no sickness, no disease, that it wasn't crippled, it wasn't defective in some way. Observe it on the 10th of Nisan. You know when Jesus came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday? It was the 10th of Nisan on the Jewish calendar. The same day, Jesus comes into Jerusalem. That's when he was selected. That's when he was inspected. That's when they saw the lamb coming into the city of Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday when he rode on a donkey into Jerusalem. That's Luke chapter 19. Number two, the sacrificial lamb was to be a year old male, specifically in the prime of its life. When was Jesus crucified? In the prime of his life. Number three, The lamb was to be without defect, no inherent or acquired 
sickness, disease, or defect. That's Exodus 12, 5. Well, Peter tells us that Jesus was our lamb without spot or blemish, without blemish or defect. He was a sinless sacrifice. He committed no sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. In other words, he took on our sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Number four, the lamb was to be sacrificed on the 14th of Nisan at twilight. Now, twilight is a term in Hebrew in Exodus 12, 4 that means the time between the two evenings. A day to the Jews, still today, starts at sundown. Our day starts at midnight. That's when we see a new day that begins. But for the Jews, it starts at sundown. The lamb had to be sacrificed in a period just before sunset where the new day started. The twilight was considered 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. The Bible tells us in Matthew 27, 45, that Jesus died at the ninth hour using Roman time, that's 3 p.m. He died exactly at the same time on Golgotha when the Passover lambs were being slaughtered on the Temple Mount. This is no coincidence. This is Jesus fulfilled in the Passover. Number five, the bread, the matzah of Passover was without yeast, Exodus 12, 8. Jesus was the bread of life without sin. John 6, 48 tells us he was the bread of life. Hebrews 4, 15 tells us that he was tempted in every way as we are, yet was without sin. Number six, the lamb was to be sacrificed without breaking a bone, Exodus 12, 46. Jesus was crucified and not a bone was broken, John 19, 36. It was also pro prophesied in Psalm 34, 20, not a bone would be broken. Even when the Roman soldier thrust the spear up underneath Jesus' rib cage, he didn't break a bone. He pierced the pericardium sac around the heart. The Bible says that blood, a mixture of blood and water spilled out because his heart had swelled during the process of crucifixion. When the pericardial sac was pierced, all of the liquid that had accumulated in the sack around the heart bled out, flooded out. In a sense, Jesus died of a broken heart. Even when he was crucified, they drove the nails between the bone structure. And it would not have been in the palm of the hands, by the way, because you would have slipped out. It would have been crucified in the wrist, right in between the bones. Not a bone was broken. Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. And number seven, the blood of the lamb was God's gracious provision to save the Jews in Egypt. Well, the blood of Jesus was God's gracious provision to save both Jews and Gentiles in the world. To summarize it all, Passover passed through Moses, commemorates the deliverance of the Jews from the slavery of Egypt. Passover present through Jesus, commemorates the deliverance of all who believe from the slavery of sin. Can I hear an amen to that? And what a better time to conclude all this than to share communion together. So the worship team is gonna come, the ushers are gonna come, and let's pray first. Lord, we thank you that you offered your life as a sacrifice for our sins. And everything about Passover was ultimately pointing to your great sacrifice, the lamb who would take away the sins of the world. Through your shed blood that marks our lives, death does not come to us. Yes, we die physically. But the moment we die physically, our spirit separates and goes to be with you forever. May our lives be marked by the blood of the Lamb. That happens by faith. We just simply believe and trust that you died on a cross for our sins. Your body was broken for us. Your blood was shed for us that we might have life. What happened in Egypt in 1450 BC was a, was a picture. It was a type of the greater deliverance from the slavery to sin that we all are bound to. But you came to set us free to deliver us from that slavery to sin, to clean us, to wash us, to save us, to forgive us. There are people here, no doubt, listening to this and they think to themselves that because of things they've done, they could never be forgiven. But Lord, we know that's just a lie from the enemy. 
Because everything we've ever, every sinful thing we've ever thought, said, or done, you died for on the cross. And if we come to you by faith, the Bible says if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is no sin that separates us from you because you died for all sins, that all might be saved. That if we put our faith in you, if we trust you as our Lord and Savior, if we believe that you died on a cross for my sins, and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, I shall be saved, Lord. That's what you tell us. That's the promise of your word. Thank you that you are our Passover lamb. We pray for Jewish people around the world that as they celebrate Passover this next week, that the eyes of their heart might be open to see the true Passover, to see Jesus who died for Jew and Gentile alike that as many as believed and received might be saved. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. And as we draw near to your table now, to the table of the Lord, to remember your body, your blood, we do this, Lord, with thanksgiving in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.